built if your V is in the same uh, relation in this kind of conclusion that is that. So that could be one way how you can solve uh, these kind of three-term problems. Of course, there can be more difficult problems, so this is one of the most simple problems you can have. It's a transitive uh, problem you can solve. Other kind of problems can be something like um, two-dimensional problems, like you have, for instance, here, A to the left of B, B is to the left of C, D is in front of C, E is in front of A, and the question is, which relation holds between D and E, and you may have mentally built up a kind of a mental model, like we've seen yesterday in the talk by, given by Sonny Kemlani, uh, of this form, and then you check, ah, okay, so um, E is to the left of D, so the relation is that uh, D is to the right of E. However, it's not always so easy that we receive kind of information, we build up our mental model, we investigate or inspect it, and then we derive our conclusion, it's always the correct one. There are other kinds of uh, problems you can think of. For instance, if you exchange the second premise B is to the left of C by the premise A is to the left of C, then you figure out that there is not only this model you here have uh, seen before possible, but there is a another uh, model possible. You see that uh, it's the position of the B uh, with C which have changed because they are indeterminate. So there is no relation between B and C directly given. So there are two models possible. And um, what studies, although, of course, this inference still holds, uh, but you would have to inspect more than one model, from a, let's say from a formal perspective. Um, and what studies show, for instance, by Johnson Nerd and Ruth Byrne, given already um, in the 90s that uh, these kind of indeterminate problems or multiple model cases um, are more difficult for the human reasoners. And this is one way how uh, difficulty can arise in reasoning about relations. Another could be uh, the following form. So let's assume for a second Alice is a blood relative of Charlie. Charlie is a blood relative of Brian. And the question like we've seen yesterday in the talk given by Sunny, what if anything follows. So who thinks that Alice is a blood relative of Brian? You may raise your hands. <laughs> okay, some think that. Who does not think that they are blood relatives? And the rest needs more time or? <laughs> Already knows it? Hmm. Um, of course, I mean, um, it depends on the level how you think. I mean, so let's pick these three, and of course, then you can uh, infer, for instance, okay, uh, she's blood relative to her, and she's blood relative to him. And so, of course, um, if we assume that they are all blood relative, then it follows, of course, that Alice is as well then blood relative uh, to Brian. However, there's another way how you can think of, and which you have experienced plenty of times in your life, that there is a mother and a father, and they can have a daughter. And of course, the daughter is blood related to the mother and to the father, but uh, in most of the cases, the mother is not uh, related to the father. Okay, so what we derive from that, it's the way how we can build up these mental representations, and it matters. Uh, and even, I mean, there are kind of course of problems where you would say, okay, um, it's difficult to find a counterexample, but this does not apply to these kinds of problems because um, we all have um, seen them. Okay, there are other kinds of problems like, let's assume Bob is taller than Debbie, um, Charlie is taller than Adam, Bob is smaller than Adam, and the question is, is Charlie taller than Debbie? And of course, it should be the case that it's not so easy for you to uh, derive uh, this case, but if I reorder um, these kinds of premises, then you can see that um, suddenly it's very easy. Charlie is taller than Adam, Adam is taller than Bob, Bob is taller than Debbie, then it's so easy to infer that Charlie is taller than Debbie. So in relational reasoning, you see that sometimes the way information is presented can have a tremendous effect on the uh, how easy or how difficult it is to derive kinds of inferences. And so this has been presented to you in a kind of a discontinuous way. So the first information you, derive, you, you received had nothing in common with the second premise. Uh, so 
This is talking about Bob and Debbie. This is talking about Charlie and Adam. Two completely separate things. And if you think in this way of building up mental models, then you have to keep in your working memory two different distinct representations of it. And only with the, getting the third premise, um, this one is then um, connected with that. And then I've uh, built in as well the kind of a trick, which is called a figure effect. Um, I have not presented everything in a taller version, but as well there's a kind of a smaller and you would need have to, um, uh, let's say, invert this uh, version into Adam is uh, taller than Bob to make this. Yeah? So what we can see from this kind of example is that um, the order of relational information uh, matters in the way how we reason about relational information. And in fact, that's one thing which we do in everyday life. I mean, you can... Um, let's say, uh, substitute taller by richer, by nicer, by more intelligent, and all these um, other relations. Again, let's um, figure out this kind of problem. So the apple is left of the peach. The peach is to the left of the plum. Oh, pure transitive task. You may have formed in your uh, mental model a kind of an arrangement like apple, peach, plum. But then, how it's in everyday life, you um, know for certain that the plum is to the left of the apple. The first question is, of course, can all three uh, statements together be consistent? No, they can't be. And the question is, I mean, assuming, yeah, okay, let's, let's come later to a kind of a, a possible counterexample to that. But um, on a, let's say, linear ordering, um, the plum is to the left of the apple um, is not consistent with this one. It contradicts uh, the kind of uh, linear arrangements you may have built. And then the question is, um, how would you revise then your mental model you may have built for that? Huh? Is plum apple peach a correct model? Who says so? I mean, if you have to revise it, then of course you have to give up one of these uh, kinds of informations you have seen before. So yes, some not at least. And the question is, uh, what about peach, plum, apple? Is that as well? No? Yes? Who says no? OK. Who says yes? OK. <laughs> Okay, so you may have built apple peach plum, then you receive this information plum apple, and if you run these kind of experiments, which have been done, for instance, by Markus Knauf, then you figure out that um, about 80% of the people prefer the plum apple peach uh, model, and in fact, even if you uh, present them with this kind of model, which is still uh, possible, because it's not the revision of the first one, but of the second uh, thing, then you see that um, this is still a model uh, of this. It depends only on which kind of premise you give up, but still most of the people don't see this. So we see that there is something which I will talk more in the following about, so-called preferred representations. They matter. They can be really re very, very strong in that. So let's come to a last problem. So um, give it last try. So for instance, in, in very small airports, um, flight operators um, only have some kind of um, information which is uh, brought to them maybe auditorially or whatever. And uh, we have something like a red plane is west of a green uh, plane, the blue plane is east of the green plane, the green plane is west of the yellow plane, and the yellow plane is west of the white plane. Uh -huh. so I know it's uh, five, um, about five planes, so it's a bit uh, difficult. And the question, of course, can the flight operator infer that necessarily the blue plane is west of the white one? Who says yes? OK, that's more to move forward. Uh, who says no? OK. OK, and the others are still computing. Um, OK, um, most answers yes. So who said yes is uh, with a majority. However, it's wrong. Um, so let's try to build up a kind of a mental model. I mean, it doesn't depend if it's a kind of a more imaginal uh, thing or if it's a more abstract thing. Um, let's figure on the kind of relation. So we have here in the first premise, the uh, red one is west of the green one. We can have this kind of a representation. Uh, we insert the blue east of the green one. 
uh, we can insert uh, the yellow um, at this position here because we say, okay, in our mental array we have um, already taken this kind of position. I will take, talk later more about this and insert there uh, the yellow one and then here the white one and then we see, okay, uh, the blue one is west of the white one so it holds. Of course, there are other models possible. Um, you could have inserted the yellow one in between the green and the blue one, and then the white one to the rest, and in this whole mod model, it still holds, and then you know already how the counter example may look like, and so this is the counter example. So, um, to rephrase the uh, uh, word, um, not all models are created equal in that sense. Uh, people do prefer some kind of um, models while they are reasoning, and it's interesting to identify them. And um, that's uh, what we have done in our experiment. So we present participants, of course, not with these uh, variables, so they were replaced by, uh, as you have seen, by planes or uh, fruits and other uh, things. And then um, they disappeared, these premises, so we forced them somehow to load up this kind of information into the working memory. So we, want, we were interested in the kind of mental representation uh, that we were using, and then we offered them different kinds of models. And they had, like you, uh, for instance, um, to decide uh, if this is a model of these kind of premises or not. And you see that uh, we have here these kinds of variations. So if you look at this model, um, I mean, you can um, see that uh, you can um, generate other models. I mean, there are three, two ways. Uh, first of all, you come up always with a new model, or you generate and transform your first built up preferred mental model into other models. And this would require more time and would uh, be more difficult, of course, and then it would lead to more errors for that. And so we were giving uh, this to participants, uh, these uh, models, and they had um, to decide if this is a model or not. And because if you give this uh, to participants, then of course you need to give them as well kind of models which are false, which I don't want to talk now uh, too much about this, um, but they were as well given uh, wrong uh, models for that. And if you look at the data in the errors in percent, then you see this is the ABCDE. It's the mnemonic uh, version of this preferred mental model, uh, which we have. Remember, we always, they had some kind of fruits, orders, uh, flights uh, of planes, uh, whatever. Uh, then we have one which is a kind of a transformation of the first one, which is switched by this uh, position of C and D. And then this last one, which then would be the kind of counterexample you've seen before, um, where we switched uh, C and E. And what you see is that um, the first one, which we call the preferred mental model, is identified in 92% uh, of the cases, while the last one has a kind of an error rate of 55%, uh, um, uh, which means that more or less no one uh, puts the all effort into it uh, to generate the possible counterexample for that. Uh, and you see as well that this, with the reaction times, it's uh, it's nice that it even increases. Huh? So those who have identified the correct ones took much longer for that. So that shows that, um, as I said, not all models are created equal. There is a kind of a preferred mental model uh, people um, build, um, and then they, if they're forced to, or if they have to check if it necessarily follows, then they try to build others. But there is a kind of a limitation. And this limitation, of course, can be um, due to kind of working memory limitations. Um, of course, there are other things like motivation and so on and so on. Yeah, so we see that in some sense it's worth to investigate if the number of operations that may be necessary to transform one model in the other uh, might um, uh, require this. So we see that um, if you would be the perfect logical machine, then of course you would have found a kind of counterexample, but humans systematically deviate from these classical logical uh, solutions for that. Um, there is this discussion going on where I don't have time, which is uh, about this bounded rationality and limitations we have, and that within these kind of limitations we're working well. Um, I will more focus on that part the question is, can we explain it? Are these differences explainable by heuristics alone that people build up? Or is it possible to develop a kind of a system which is able to predict these reasoning difficulties we have for these kinds of relational uh, reasoning problems? And of course, the question is, uh, let's 
aim at a big goal. Um, we do not only want to have a kind of a cognitive model for that, but we want to have an algorithmic uh, description of it. And then, of course, we want to evaluate it on the empirical data, which means we have to uh, put together somehow the more qualitative um, predictions of the model and the empirical uh, predictions which are our, our findings which are quantitatively. So we have to transfer somehow the qualitativeness into numbers. And of course, um, as I promised, there are kind of uh, possibilities even to think about if this prediction is not only on the predictions on the, on the, for the correctness or for the reaction times, but we may have a look at, well, if it's possible to say that the brain activations that are going on, because you're not only a logical calculus, but you are an embodied um, person. And so um, in your brain, while you're solving these problems and while you have solved these problems, there are kind of activations. And the question is, can we try to identify them somehow? OK. So um, let's, um, um, yeah, for the following, briefly uh, repeat these uh, things. So we have here kind of an experiment. We have a human agent, that is the typical participant or the typical reasoner. Um, he perceives these kinds of problems and he wants to generate an action. And when I'm talking about a model, um, then I'm talking about a kind of a um, computational or cognitive system uh, which does more or less the same things. And um, it predicts uh, data like uh, the correctness, for instance, the response times, even if possible, something like eye movements or fMRI data, and then we can compare it uh, with the data we have received from the uh, human agent. And what we have already seen, that there are kind of differences between these uh, pure logical systems. Uh, I mean, if you think of uh, classical logic, like propositional logic or first order logic, um, then um, we cannot simply apply this kind of logical calculus because there's no ordering on, on possible um, worlds or models on that. There are some non-monotonic logics which can be applied uh, in that, but I don't have... Uh, Time to talk about more of it. So in some sense, we want to uh, reverse engineer the uh, inference process. And because they are taking place on one computational uh, unit, which is in your brain, in some sense, uh, we need as well to talk about the memory, which may pose these kind of um, limitations on that. Some people um, say, OK, well, why don't just use artificial neural networks uh, for that? So we train them, we give them these kinds of problems, and then they show the similar behavior like uh, humans do. However, the problem is um, that we aim to classify problems for their reasoning difficulty. And um, so artificial neural networks typically are not good for that. OK, so um, I've presented you these preferred mental models. Um, I will talk about three phases in the following. So um, the first one is a kind of a construction phase. You receive your premise. You build up your first initial model. How you build it, uh, I will say uh, later more about that. Then once you have built this, you will inspect this model. You search. For instance, if you have to generate something like what if anything follows, like we've seen yesterday in the talk by Sunny, you may look into your uh, mental model. Um, if you have uh, given a kind of a conclusion, then you check if this possible conclusion holds in your model. And then for the case of indeterminate problems, we've seen the multiple model cases where you can have several models for that, then of course you would try to look into other mo models because the first one you have uh, may have built uh, only um, um, justifies or is consistent with these possible uh, conclusion, but there might be a kind of a counterexample which you might uh, look uh, for. It. Okay, so um, the idea is um, to put this uh, more textbook description into um, a kind of a model, and the question is. Um, how can we do that? So first, if you look in the literature, then we find um, some um, assumptions about uh, these spatial relational uh, reasoning things. So um, you can assume a kind of a, a spatial array, a spatial structure where you can insert these mental models. So they are not in the free space. Um, there is an interesting discussion about if this space, in fact, is a continuous space or if it's a discrete space. Um, 
I mean, everyone assumes that it, it's a continuous space. However, um, you can um, show that some of these uh, generations of these mental models require that once you have put two pieces together, they are somehow linked. And to break it up and to put something in between is possible, of course, but it, it requires more effort. In that sense, you can think about these uh, chunks uh, like we have um, yeah, heard yesterday, for instance, in the talks. Um, they are built kind of mental uh, representations and you keep them in your um, memory and whenever possible you uh, only uh, take them from memory and extend them and not really try to break it up because this may uh, cost more. Okay. Um, there are three phases involved in reasoning. Well, um, these three phases I have mentioned, uh, these models are successively generated from the premises. So you try to build up your model so you don't wait until you have all the kind of information and then you build your model, but you do it successively. That's due to a better uh, memory efficient uh, way of dealing with this kind of information because um, you can see that, um, for instance, experiments which uh, Phil Johnson Laird has done, uh, people forget specific uh, kind of um, informations. So they build up initial, their, their mental model and then you ask them, have you seen, for instance, this kind of premise and they don't know it um, anymore. So in that sense, you take the kind of information out of these models and uh, then you can even uh, lower the activation or you can forget this kind of information. And there is something um, which uh, we will in the following say, uh, which makes plenty of work. This is uh, called a uh, so-called focus, which will do these kinds of um, operations. So um, this is a system, prism system, which we have developed. Um, so we see that uh, from the previous um, problem, so different mental models have different demands. Uh, so some models are easier to build up, others are more difficult. And the question is, can we first uh, specify these mental model operations? I mean, in some sense, I'm always talking about them, but what are these exact things? So how do you build up your mental model with which you deal with? And then, of course, once, um, so um, you can say, without having kind of a computational model, there's nothing like a cognitive uh, or, or a complexity measure. A complexity measure requires some form of model which can predict them. And so that once we can specify these things, we can apply notions, which we know, for instance, from artificial intelligence to uh, build up a kind of a um, um, complexity measure for that. Okay, so um, let's start with a very simple thing, with the easiest possible. Let's take this, uh, which may remind you in a kind of a two-dimensional Turing machine. Um, you have a kind of a slots where you can place kind of information like the pliers are to the left of the hammers. So you have here your focus, you have here the premise information, and here um, you have your uh, control process which translate these premises somehow into operations from this focus. So you insert at the very first position uh, your pliers, pliers and um, so what you see is you have a kind of an input, a data structure in computational terms. Uh, these objects can have activations, you can forget them. I mean, you have inserted it into your um, mental model, but um, it's possible that you do not remember after you've inserted several others. You can have a kind of a semantic network, of course, for that. And then once you have this manipulation unit, you can um, think about all these things. So something like insert, um, this delete nodes is a more technical thing which uh, you can use uh, for explain, for instance, these forgettings which depend on the activations. And um, you can set um, annotations on objects in these indeterminate cases. That is, once you uh, receive something like A's to the left of B, A's to the left of C, when you insert your A, B first, and then you get A's to the left of C, then you could insert it, in, of course, in between or uh, to the outer part um, of this uh, already built model. And then, um, of course, for previous, um, let's say, rebuilding of another or generating an alternative model, you need this kind of information, which is directly the notion uh, you have from these uh, premise information. Okay, um, once we have these kinds of operations, we can simply start to count them, for instance. So 
um, we can say, okay, how difficult is it to insert an object? How difficult is it to put an object in between if you have to move um, other uh, objects? And by this we can, uh, for instance, uh, start to classify these problems. If they are uh, measures of how difficult the problems for humans are, it's not that. It's only we can get somehow a um, complexity measure for that. Okay, so um, let's start with the first one, just to give you an idea. So you have this uh, flight A is west of flight B, flight C is east of flight B, B is west of flight D, D is west of flight E, and it may remind you uh, at a uh, model problem you've seen before, and the question is, is flight C west of E? And so you can start with your premise information, which is something like uh, you see on your screen in an abbreviated uh, version A is west of B, and your control process uh, says to the focus, okay, insert your A there. And then you see that there is a kind of a counter, so once you move your focus, you, of course, uh, count, uh, can count them up, and then you go one step to the right, and um, you see then, now you get C to the uh, east of B, um, no, in fact, uh, that's wrong. So if you have to insert, for instance, D's west, no, I think that there is something going wrong. Um, let's um, focus on this uh, below. So we see here A to the left of B. Then uh, we insert C to the east of uh, B. We insert it here. And then we get this new notion that uh, premise B is west of D, so we are at C. We need to go back to our reference object because this premise only says something about uh, B and D, and B is already in your mental model. So you go back, um, you go back to your uh, B, go one step to the right, and uh, figure out okay, this place is already taken, and you insert your uh, D there, and then you uh, can insert your E there. And when you do this and you have counted these kinds of operations, then you figure out building this kind of preferred mental model requires something like 11 operations. If you would have built first ABC and then inserted D, it requires 13 operations. And if you have um, built first ABDC and then um, inserted E in between D and C because you need first to shift C uh, to the right and insert an E, then you need uh, 15 operations. So it's a pure uh, a prediction of the model. But if you um, look at these data I've presented you uh, before, then we see that um, the correlation um, is uh, good. So we see that uh, the 11 operations uh, go with these 8%, 13 operations with 19%, and 15 operations with these 56% uh, uh, of the cases, and with the response times, it's the same. However, um, this is so far only a pure theoretical uh, play which you have done uh, so far. If you like, um, you can um, do this as well. So there's a kind of a um, app you can try online, um, which is, I don't know if this fits in. Um, you can go at spatialmentalmodels.appspot.com and then you can um, play around with this. And what you see is here, you can insert premises like um, A is left of B, and um, you can insert B is left of C here. And if you like, you can really put into this kind of uh, problem we have seen before. Um, D is left of E, and you, for instance, like to check um, if in this model, um, E is left of C. And before I uh, say, okay, uh, solve this problem, we see that uh, there are these kind of focus operations which are calculated, the move and read operation, the right uh, grouping is if you have, for instance, these uh, discontinuous uh, models like A is left of B, C is left of D, and then you have to uh, insert them somehow. There are some tricky um, insertions uh, possible. You can even start to count the direction changes of your focus, for instance, if you like, or you can um, add and delete um, some kind of layers. You have here the reasoners output, so the predictions of this model implemented in it, um, and uh, the logical evaluation for that. Here you see that there are some things like additional facts. So for instance, for this belief revision uh, problem I've shown you, um, you can um, check as well if this holds, or for instance, if you like, uh, you can say, okay, um, 
there you can run experiments with uh, in your mental, mental uh, models if you have to rearrange um, um, objects which are not so heavy and objects which are heavy if this makes a difference or not. So there's work um, from um, Gießen where they have investigated these things. Um, okay, so you can uh, try this out. Um, so let's have a, a look. So it starts to build up um, this uh, representation you see here and um, it says okay so the evaluation um, is um, that um, yeah so the conclusion um, E is left of C is invalid um, so the, the logical one but um, in that sense yeah so um, yeah, no. the evaluation in this model is logically correct, but the response is invalid. And we see here that, um, as I said before, we have these kinds of um, annotations. So, uh, for instance, D to the right of B and E to the right of D. So once we have inserted, and you see that this is in gray um, color, that these objects are um, uh, movable. So in that sense, they are not fixed. They can be used to build up your alternative um, mental model for that. Okay. So. Ah, okay. Okay, so, so far this focuses a predictor for reasoning difficulty. However, it's only a pure theoretical assumption, so it doesn't uh, matter if, um, if they really make predictions so far, but the question is, is, is it possible to uh, justify this uh, focus empirically? And uh, one way how we could try this, uh, for instance, um, is with an uh, eye movement study. So um, you can present participants with a kind of a screen where there's, there is a kind of an object um, already placed, but it will be the only object which will appear. So it's more for a kind of a fixation that participants look at the very spot if they appear. So it always starts in the sense that you say, um, okay, the green car is to the left of the red car. And so they know, okay, there's a green car, but the red car or whatever will never appear. So this will be the only object which uh, stays on that. Because, I mean, if there would be other visual stimuli, then it's clear participants will look at this very position um, because it's the kind of stimulus uh, they heard and then they um, will try to um, look at this uh, very thing. But what happens if you do not present participants with these uh, kinds of um, information? And um, that's what we have done. So we have given participants 32 problems, uh, determinate ones where there's only one model uh, possible, like A is left of B, B is left of C, and indeterminate ones, uh, in that sense, uh, four models. So A is to the left of B, and then you can say C is to the left of B, which allows you to insert it in between, or to the left, and then you get D is to the left of C, and then E is to the left of D, and then you can build up these different kind of models, and then you can ask wh what relation um, has C to E or E to C. And we gave participants only these relations left of and right of, and a visual presentation of the first object only, and uh, they had then to uh, do these kinds of conclusions. And here we see that uh, we have here a fixation probability. So this green car uh, resembles uh, the position five in this uh, grid, so uh, that would be four, three, two, one. So this uh, doesn't count the first one, and then this is six, seven, eight, nine. And you see that once they received the premise information auditorily, like the green car is to the left of the yellow car, first they, of course, look at the green car, but then, uh, or, or the red car is to the left of the green car, um, so you see that first uh, the um, activation, the fixation probability is high on this uh, first uh, car, which um, is as expected, and then they uh, look at the left position. You may say, okay, they might be looking at these kinds of problems uh, because they expect them to, to appear one new thing, but we presented uh, them several of these problems again and again, and it was clear that nothing really um, appeared. In the next step, then we said something like, okay, uh, the um, black car is to the left of uh, this uh, red car, and then they directly looked at this position. So this is the determinate case, and that's what we expect, um, that they look in um, at this very uh, spot. 
The more interesting case, of course, is uh, what happens if you present participants with indeterminate problems. Uh, problems where several models are uh, possible, then of course you see that it's a get kind of more noisy uh, the data. Um, here you have the determinate case um, by these uh, continuous lines and with these uh, dashed lines it's the um, kind of indeterminate case and you see in some sense especially at this position um, here that um, the fact that um, in the determinate case uh, they look first at this um, interest area 3 um, and then in the indeterminate case, they look at well as this uh, one, but a bit later. And so that means there are kind of additional processes going on, but um, they are similar to the determinate case. And if you look into this, then you uh, can find out that, uh, in fact, you can start to read out the preferred mental model representation uh, they have um, in the indeterminate case. So. Um, yeah, so the interesting thing is um, in the indeterminate case that this fixation is uh, taking part uh, later, but um, still it's the um, fixation which corresponds or the place which corresponds with the insertion of the uh, very object. And that's, um, if you take for instance in the uh, prism, the focus, you have for instance A's left of B and C's right of A, which is a kind of an indeterminate case then this can be, for instance, explained like you get this, you get back to your reference object, and then um, you insert this. And this takes, of course, longer times uh, to do so. So in that sense, uh, we can say, okay, these predictions of eye movements are somehow uh, correlated to these uh, focus um, operations. However, as I said, um, the interesting uh, part is um, can we use this kind of model extended somehow uh, that we can uh, predict empirical data for this. So in that sense we want to um, check if the responses and response times participants are giving are equal to those which are predicted by the model. And so to do so, of course, the model itself, it can only generate something like account operations for these kinds of operations. Um, we implement PRISM in a cognitive architecture, um, ACT-R. And um, I can't say too much about ACT-R uh, now. Um, however, it's a production rule system. Um, uh, like, for instance, like we've seen uh, yesterday, we have a kind of a precondition which allows then a rule to fire, so then it performs a kind of an action. It has a kind of a modular structure. Uh, you already see there's a kind of a brain and you can map these different modules. For instance, here uh, you have the visual module, so the visual information uh, you receive. The manual module is uh, active, for instance, when you press a key. Um, retrieval uh, buffer declarative module is important for um, storing facts, for instance. And then there are two interesting things like the goal module, which says what is the plan, what should I do in this typical uh, task in a very general uh, way. And you have an imaginal module, which can be used, for instance, if you calculate or add different kinds of um, numbers, uh, for instance, and you have to keep them in your memory, then you would use the imaginal module. And the idea is now to bring somehow this um, prism model uh, and this act our architecture together because I mean it's an architecture that means you have to specify this kind of model and what we would like to specify is of course this prism uh, into it. And the nice thing or what we expect is not only to have kind of a symbolic parts that's what's already predicted by um, our prism uh, module but it has as well kind of sub symbolic uh, parts uh, like activation so you can uh, forget uh, different kind of um, objects and um, as well interesting later for these fMRI um, investigations are these uh, mind-brain um, mapping hypotheses. Okay, so um, this is a schematic uh, part. Um, I mean the code uh, consists of several thousand lines of code in ACT-R. So I cannot really show this to you but um, for the visual buffer, let's assume something like X is left of V is presented, or first X and then V, then you see in your imaginal buffer, um, you transfer it from your visual notion into an imaginal buffer, so the imaginal buffer is the place where we will uh, assume now 
uh, for the sake of argument first, um, that uh, mental models are built there and there's a kind of a cognitive bottleneck in ACT R, which means that you can keep only uh, one chunk in it uh, for a, a certain uh, amount of time. So once you have built this, you put it into declarative uh, memory, you receive new information, you build this in your imaginal uh, buffer, and then you have to um, integrate this, ver this uh, information uh, from uh, before, and then again you store it in the declarative uh, memory for that. So what you see um, in that is, um, for instance, uh, you, you have this information that V is to the left of Z. Here you have your XV from declarative memory. You see that you need to insert this new information then in this uh, kind of chunk. And then, for instance, you can uh, be presented with this X and Z if X is left of Z in your uh, model build and um, check this. And um, if you do so, you can uh, start to calculate. Um, that's what ActR as well offers, uh, that for all the kind of operations, uh, for instance, for um, each firing of um, production rule, it assumes something like 50, milli 50 milliseconds. And you can uh, start um, to have a look if these response times you have uh, from the participants in the experiments, if they correlate for the different kind of tasks um, with the predictions of the model, and um, that's the case for the response times and for the um, error rates um, as well. So errors um, are, for instance, um, generated by these uh, retrieval errors you have from declarative memory, so that it um, you can, uh, you can uh, query this kind of information, but it's not uh, always the case that you can get it back. That's due to the sub-symbolic um, um, activation in ACT-R. However, um, interesting is uh, now, as we have now a kind of a bridge between um, this symbolic model implemented in ACT-R and on the other side we have um, these uh, neural um, parts, um, the question is which brain regions are involved in relational reasoning. If you go uh, back for a second um, to this uh, brain and we assume that this um, um, manipulation is there, then we see that um, this imaginal module is um, mapped to the Broadman area 7, 39, and 40, uh, for instance, and it computes you into a kind of a mathematical uh, formula, a kind of an activation actor. And so we can try to test if these predictions, if our implementation of the mental models um, into the imaginal module would be right, or, for instance, just to uh, say, assume that, um, if, for instance, metal models would be built here in the prefrontal cortex. And so the um, question is which brain regions are actually involved in relational reasoning. We have kind of a prediction uh, now, but the question is how is the reality? And then what are the functions of these associated uh, brain regions? And to evaluate this, um, so far, we have this uh, computation model, we have this uh, correlate for the focus, we have a qualitative and quantitative predictions uh, replicated, and now the question is about the localization of these uh, spef specific uh, neural uh, processes, if you can predict these bold activations. And for that, we have a look at this uh, prism in ACT-R and uh, compute these uh, again. And before we can um, compare the model with the fMRI data, um, I'm going to present you a uh, study which has been conducted by uh, Thomas Fangmeier, which reminds you on this uh, first three-term uh, problem. So he presented in a scanner uh, participants, so that's what the participants saw, um, presented them different kinds of symbols, like an X on the left side or a V on the right side, uh, not at the same time which resembled uh, the premise information. The reason why he used um, the uh, symbolic uh, presentation without giving kind of relations, the relation is only implicitly uh, be given by the uh, location of the objects is because he does not want to have these linguistic activations as well in his uh, memory, uh, in his um, fMRI data. So, um, let's have a look. So that's uh, what they saw as the first premise. V is to the left of X. 
then, for instance, x is to the left of z, and then they uh, received a kind of a conclusion, is x left of z, and then they had to press yes and no, uh, for instance. And the activation has been um, taken at premise one, premise two, and conclusion. And that's uh, what he found out. So here, again, we see the timeline. That's um, how it was uh, presented. Um, here are the kind of um, premises, and this is the conclusion, and these are the activations. And you see, first, in the construction phase, we have here an occipital temporal cortex activation, which means um, that participants are processing more or less the premise information. In a second sp step, which is here uh, the inspection phase, so they have built up in their mental model um, their, uh, the first mental model of V and X, and then they uh, received um, a new information, X and Z, and they see, okay, these two have something in common, they integrate it, and this requires additional uh, planning operations which can be uh, localized, for instance, in the anterior prefrontal cortex. And then for the conclusion, so they have now to check if uh, the V is to the left of Z, then we see that we have here an interesting region activated, which uh, we will later see more about this, uh, namely that's the uh, so-called superior parietal lobe, um, or the BA7, or where the imaginal module maps these things, um, so these mental uh, model operations too. Before that, uh, let's have a comparison between these um, um, two things. So here we have the uh, brain activations, um, which are in this uh, graphic here above. So this is uh, the bold response signal, and uh, you see that in it. In, so for premise one, you have here the occipital temporal cortex, anterior prefrontal cortex, and posterior parietal cortex, which is the BA7 or the superior parietal lobe. And um, you see that in the beginning, it's um, higher here on the. Um, uh, anterior prefrontal cortex, um, it gets even higher at the second, um, um, once they receive the second premise, and uh, they have here, uh, while in a conclusion at this, where the uh, posterior parietal cortex activation is high, and these are the predictions which we have from this uh, ACT-R implementation on the visual module, on the goal module, and the imaginal uh, module. Uh, and we see if we calculate um, the correlations, uh, then we see that the correlations is um, acceptable. Uh, so um, for this kind of modeling um, where, we only, where we did not tweak or uh, put something into the um, ACT-R model, but only transferred the prism uh, into it uh, by this schematic uh, presentation I've shown uh, to you that it uh, builds up these chunks and um, inserts the objects at the very notion and then sometimes we have to switch between the modules so once it's built in the imagine module we have to transfer it for instance uh, to the um, um, declarative uh, memory which is uh, then uh, co connected with this um, uh, anterior prefrontal cortex and the goal. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's uh, have a look at this. So this ACT-R prism, it makes correct predictions for the domain of uh, spatial relational uh, reasoning. We can extend this, uh, of course. Uh, however, this um, mapping is a really uh, broad mapping. So there are only this restri restricted number of places you can uh, map them to. There are only a, s a certain amount of uh, possible um, uh, modules uh, you have. Um, and we have these spatial mental modules manipulated by the imaginal module. And the idea is, um, can we do some more work to justify if um, these spatial mental models are really at this uh, very spot or not? So the question is, um, can these mental operations be localized? Let's say from a, another uh, perspective. So we um, use two methods, first a meta-analysis and then a, a TMS study. Um, so there has been uh, done a meta-analysis by Prado in 2011. However, it's a very broad uh, implementation. It focuses on conditional relational and logistic reasoning. And um, we were interested more on pure relational and visual uh, reasoning, and we uh, decided to use uh, so-called ICOF maps, where we uh, have a kind of a, a probability that for uh, here you see this kind of percentage, which uh, resembles this ICOF uh, percentage, which means that from 10 brains, uh, how many of these new brains which have been uh, used um, 
localize this very position, which is this kind of activation due to the coordinates in this exact region. So that's an additional um, yeah, fine-grained uh, measure you can uh, do for that. And what you uh, figure out uh, immediately is that you have some kind of uh, activation, for instance, Vinod Gull, who has uh, been talking as well at this conference uh, before. In other areas, uh, you see that there's not so much going on for the spatial uh, visual region, but there is one region where it's a really very high, uh, a very high um, activation, namely here in the um, superior parietal uh, cope cortex or lobe um, in BA5 and 7. Uh, so in more or less in all of the studies something is going on. However, um, as you may know, um, in fMRI most of the things are uh, correlational uh, things. Yeah? Only because there is a kind of a uh, correlation in it, it does not mean that there are really these kind of processes going on. And second, I mean, we have a kind of a computational model and we are interested on the uh, very level of these um, operations which are there. How can we connect something like uh, let's say, um, the focus operation to a kind of an activation on this broad uh, base. It does not work. Uh, it does not work with that. And so the question is, what can we do? Is there something more we can do to identify if um, these uh, processes which we found in this meta-analysis has really something to do with these kind of mental model operations? Uh, and um, so here again, uh, this is this region here, the superior parietal lobe, which is uh, here um, approximately. And um, that's the reason why we decided to use a transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can um, use uh, or lead to some kind of transient transient and focal disruption of these neural processes. However, it's more kind of a noise you uh, induce into the uh, brain. And um, like always, I mean, in fMRI studies or in um, um, other studies, um, you would like to present participants with a high number of problems because, I mean, from only one or two problems, you cannot read out the kind of information you're interested in. So we uh, yeah, punished uh, participants with 72 indeterminate reasoning problems. So <laughs> lucky you, you had only five or so. Um, and uh, we have these uh, two uh, stimulation sites. So um, you stimulate at the vertex where you, it's a kind of a control condition. So there's nothing really going on on the vertex if you stimulate it. And on this superior parietal lobe uh, where is the uh, place which is uh, interesting for us. And we presented participants with, these, uh, with the preferred model um, which is you might uh, recognize this as ABCDE model, the preferred mental model, and um, the ABDEC alternative uh, model, which is the one with the largest distance uh, you need to transform this preferred mental model to. So uh, we decided to uh, give them the uh, maximal um, difficulty in solving these uh, kinds of problems. And um, a second thing which you see is that in this order we gave them a discontinuous order. So A is left of B, B is left of C. It's one mental model you build, then you have D is left of E, which is another and separate one, because we want to induce more uh, heavy load on the uh, working memory on that. And only with a fourth premise uh, they could then um, integrate this kind of information. Uh, and this is, a, of course, a very interesting spot where you have first two disparate mental models in your working memory, and then you integrate this, and there is the preferred place or time uh, to apply this TMS. So if they have to integrate it, and then you try to induce some noise in this process, then the kind of, and this is the very position where it should take place, this kind of integration. So you're building your integration of mental models, uh, then it should have a kind of an um, effect um, on that. So again, um, this is how participants were presented in the screen with it. It's a linguistic, uh, um, as well linguistically or verbally uh, presented premises. The apple is left of the pear, the pear is left of the mango, the kiwi is left of the peach. You see, uh, it has nothing to do with that. And then only with the uh, um, fourth premise, the pear is to the left of the um, kiwi is then the integrating um, premise uh, with that, and then we applied here the TMS on that. And then 
um, they received this uh, model and then they had to uh, decide is this a valid model or not and um, of course we present participants again with roots and other things which do not have a kind of a specific um, arrangement. And so then they had to press yes and no uh, for that. And um, when you look at this, then um, you see here uh, the blue one is the superior parietal lobe, the green is the vertex condition, here's the preferred, the uh, alternative and the incorrect uh, model uh, for that. And um, you see that um, the um, stimulation side um, made a difference. So the accuracy decreased from the vertex simulation where we said there is no kind of uh, possible influence on that as an accepted control condition or sham control. Um, and uh, by um, stimulating in the superior parietal lobe, we see that um, it decreased from, um, um, let's say, 88% to 82% um, uh, on that. For an alternative model, we see that everything is uh, lower, but that's uh, what we have seen uh, before, although participants uh, repeatedly get these kind of indeterminate uh, problems. Um, the, the performance on generating this alternative model is uh, lower, and this uh, difference here is not significant, while this is a significant one. And then we see a very interesting thing, uh, which I haven't seen so far uh, very often, that uh, for two conditions, it does not make a difference for the incorrect model. And what does this tell us about? Well, um, identifying a model that is, is not correct or not consistent uh, may obviously take uh, place at other uh, parts in the human brain, and you rarely get something like a, a, a perfect non-difference um, between these uh, kind of conditions, but we had it um, here. Okay, so um, to um, sum up, um, so the behavioral data support the construction and manipulation of these preferred mental models. Um, these operations were interesting and they uh, lead us to implement this um, in ACT R to make these behavioral and neural uh, predictions. This meta analysis shows that uh, for these relational integration and these um, much of relational integration takes uh, really part in the uh, posterior parietal cortex, uh, specifically in the region uh, in the superior parietal um, lobe and um, that's what uh, this um, TMS study um, additionally uh, supported. So um, that's um, more or less what I uh, wanted to show you so that uh, Cognitive computational uh, model um, requires this working memory, so that was the reason why we have implemented an um, ACT R to make these kinds of uh, predictions as well, that we have this uh, possibility as well to predict um, the response times and to predict as well the kind of um, neural activation on that, so a model that uh, captures uh, the computational level uh, in that sense that it uh, makes predictions of a cognitive complexity measure, a behavioral level uh, in these errors and response times, and a um, neural level as well over a, a time course of uh, presentations. And um, by this localization, we have even identified where these at least uh, model integration processes um, take place. And so at this point, um, I'd like to um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.